Hello everyone, I am Etherman, this is my friend Dr. Smart Contract, and our new irregular podcast, Crypto Not For Dummies. Let's roll. Guten Tag. What is a crypto exchange? Good question. It works similarly to an exchange, but dealing in crypto. In fact, it's a place or a service. Organization, I would say. Which exchanges some assets for others, particularly cryptocurrency assets. In general, if we compare it to the real world, it is a market where buyers and sellers meet and work through the order book. There is a bid price, an ask price and a spread. The exchange acts, in this case, as a platform, an organization where buyers and sellers meet and, accordingly, carry out their transactions. There are a bunch of other assets, let's say. A large number of assets they trade there. They are either futures contracts for the raw material supply or... What raw materials? Etherman, what raw material supplies? We're talking about crypto. Bitcoin supply, you mean? Bitcoin supply, yeah, to the ends of the city. We compared Wall Street and the classical system we have. And in that case, either company stocks or commodities futures contracts are traded, and later the traders invented all kinds of, let's say, financial and stock products to fleece your money, starting with leverage trading and so on. I guess we'll get to that later. We will cover this in detail. What is the difference between centralized and decentralized exchanges? I guess that's your expertise. Go on. First and foremost, you all friends are not dummies and should know the golden rule of crypto, not your keys, not your coins. So, the key difference, I would say, is that in the case of centralized exchanges you always transfer your assets, in particular Bitcoin or Ether, or any other shitcoin, to the hot wallets of the centralized exchange where they're stored. Then you trade in their trading terminal, it is actually a database on their server, you finish trading with plus or minus. In case of plus, you make a request for withdrawing these funds to your wallet. In the case of a decentralized exchange, you do not hand control over your funds. There is a group of contracts made as DEXs, there are contract pairs. In case of a DEX running on the Ethereum blockchain, you send Ether as a native token and get any other ERC20 token in return. Respectively, the golden rule is that in case of centralized exchanges you physically transfer your funds to their exchange wallets, hot wallets, you trade, and then you can make a withdrawal request. Hence, you send Ether as one transaction and get your ERC20 token back. That way, you never hand control over your funds. That's the most basic and golden rule or difference between DEXs and CEXs. Now, you can also guess why Ether has such high gas fees. Since DEXs have become very popular in the last few years, now we pay a lot of money for Ether transactions. It's worth noting here that governments do not like everything anonymous and decentralized. And let's say, CEXs, centralized exchanges, get some accreditation by the state and are a more acceptable tool for the state, their laws and regulations. And DXs, in their turn, can't be regulated, controlled, because, as we all know, the smart contract is neither an animate being, nor an organization, it is just a piece of code in a yes or no format, no third option given. In this situation, you have a machine acting as an intermediary. It's unclear who will be to claim in this case. In addition, after the transaction is made, we have one wallet that sends funds to the exchange contract and receives its money back. But you do not know who this wallet is until this wallet makes a failure and its digital footprint will lead to its identity. Then we can go back and link that wallet to the person. But again, we are getting ahead of ourselves. That is, DEX means decentralization and anonymity. It's all good. This is the ideal we seek. But CEXs is something that in principle will probably advance the industry and is more acceptable to the governments. In any way, all the regulations and all the laws will still be framed around CEXs. And because that's the platform you have to pass KYC on. Of course, there are trading limits available without verifying your identity. But in general in order to safely trade on a centralized exchange, you have to complete the KYC procedure, file your documents and link them to your identity. Yes, because in that case money belongs to John underscore Doe at gmail.com, and in this case money belongs to you, as you have passed KYC and reached another level of relationship with the CXs. XX. Phone call for you. Hello. What 
tools does a crypto exchange offer? As we said before, a crypto exchange gives you, if we're talking about CXs, a spot terminal, a futures terminal, a margin terminal, as well as other additional tools such as joining mining pools and so on. But the main thing is the three pillars of the market and centralized crypto exchanges. They include a spot terminal, when you trade without leverage, i.e. you buy an asset and keep it in your account, then you sell it and make a profit. When we talk about the leverage terminal, it means that you have a leverage, through which you can earn more money, say, at a lower volatility at the expense of the leverage. Let's say you have 1% volatility, which means that the difference between the buy and sell exchange rates for 1,000 US dollars is one figure, and another for 5,000 US dollars. If we are talking about the futures terminal, it reminds us of a small casino in the crypto market today. However, it is also a working tool for trading. It has a completely different leverage. That is, in case of margin trading you trade with 5x leverage on average, and in case of futures trading, you trade with 20 to 25x leverage, which means your risks increase multiple times your leverage, because if the price doesn't move in your direction, then consequently the exchange risks only with your money. If you have deposited $1,000, but trade in $25,000, if the price of the asset has fallen in multiples of your $700, the exchange will close your position, you will lose your money, which means that you have lost the game. This is why newbies are more recommended to work with the spot market, because this way you buy the asset and keep it, no matter whether it was 1000 US dollars yesterday and 100 US dollars today. You buy one unit of the asset, and you will keep one unit of this asset. In case of futures trading or a leveraged margin trading, respectively, you will face a liquidation and you will be left with absolutely no money. You will still have a funding rate, because in case of margin trading, you trade with borrowed funds, that's not fee-free either. You will pay some small fraction of a percentage of borrowed assets as a funding rate on your margin position, that's the first thing. Second, each position has its liquidation price. The liquidation price is reached when the price of the secured asset goes below the secured debt level. Accordingly, in this case, your position is liquidated, the exchange withholds part of your money or possibly all of it, and you get a negative deal, that is, minus funding rate and plus a liquidation penalty, the percentage the exchange charges from you if you reach the liquidation price. A lot of you must remember things like short squeezes, where a lot of people trading with leverages keep their margin positions and they're just neatly knocked off by one candle. From the market. And then Wall Street guys jump off the roofs. Yeah, margin trading always involves higher risks than you, my dear friends, should always keep this in mind. Hence, if you use it, Use it carefully and always wisely. Try to make your liquidation price as low as possible in order to hedge your risks. That was our new irregular show, Crypto Not For Dummies, with Etherman and Dr. Smart Contract. Give a thumbs up and hit the notification bell. Subscribe. See you soon, guys.